And here we are. So welcome everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Happy Testa and uh, I am the Artistic Director of uh, um, uh, Librissimi Toronto Italian Book Festival. Welcome to this presentation this afternoon. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to the special online edition to, of the festival, which is now in its third year. Um, due to COVID, a couple of months ago, we canceled the physical event while the programming was still being finalized. Then we decided to brave the internet and try to bring you a reduced but still rich online edition. All the presentations uh, will be available live by registering on Zoom, which I can see some of you have already done. And this will give you a chance to ask questions directly. So we're going to try to reserve a few minutes uh, to take questions from the audience for, for uh, Nina Ricci, who is with us this afternoon. Uh, to ask your questions, you just need to click on the Q&A button located at the bottom of your screen. And uh, before uh, beginning this presentation, I want to acknowledge the Comites uh, Organizing Committee, composed this year by Michela Di Marco, who is uh, with us, and Daniela Sansone, as well as uh, uh, myself. And thank you very much uh, to Patrimonio Italiano TV, who, uh, which is broadcasting uh, our festival this year live in Italy and around the world, actually. Uh, and thank you also to Istituto Italiano di Cultura and Columbus Center for their support so far. So without further ado, it's uh, really a great pleasure to have with us uh, this afternoon Nino Ricci. Uh, and uh, by way of introduction, I'll give you a little bit of his bio. Uh, Nino Ricci's first novel, Lives of the Saints, garnered international acclaim, appearing in 17 countries and winning a host of awards, including the Governor General's Award for Fiction. It formed the first volume of a trilogy that was adapted as a miniseries starting, starring Sophia Loren. Richie is also the author of the novel Testament, winner of the Trillium Award, and The Origin of Species, which earned him a second Governor General's Award, and as well as the biography Pierre Elliott Trudeau, part of uh, Penguin's Extraordinary Canadian series. His most recent novel is Sleep, winner of the Canadian Authors uh, Award for Fiction. Ricci holds an honorary doctorate from the University of Windsor and is uh, past president of Penn Canada. In 2011, he was appointed a member of the Order of Canada. He has taught at institutions across North America, including Colorado College and Princeton University, and is currently the inaugural holder of the Western University's Alice Munro Chair in Creativity. Nino, what a pleasure. Welcome with us this afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a shame it can't be in person, but you, you seem to have managed to make this work. Well, we're having a few little technical problems. Hopefully everything will work out for the best. And I know that uh, uh, when we were first having our physical edition, as a matter of fact, you were um, you were supposed to join us, but uh, uh, you were also supposed to be celebrating something quite special yeah, for your family today. <laughs> yes, uh, my parents' uh, 70th wedding anniversary. It, it kind of boggles my mind uh, even wow. to think of the uh, the longevity of their, 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 their you know what what they've managed uh, in in their in their lives and. Uh, they, they actually, the, the actual anniversary was uh, in February, February 12th, but they had planned for a huge celebration today, uh, in fact, and, uh, and about, uh, uh, I guess, four or five weeks ago, they decided they were going to have to cancel it, or, uh, owing to, to COVID, which is a shame, but hopefully yeah. uh, we'll be able to celebrate it uh, down the line. My mother's, uh, my mother turned 93 in uh, Wow. In April, my father will turn 91 this year. Um, fortunately, they're very healthy at the moment. Uh, they live in a retirement home, but they're they're fine. But it's a shame that uh, uh, we won't be able to celebrate it. Uh, just in our immediate family, I think there's something like 55 people. That's just uh, children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. Uh, so there's no way they would have allowed us <laughs> to congregate in those <laughs> 
<laughs> that would have been a bit uh, a bit much for everybody, I would say these times. But it's um, so I'm uh, actually glad to start talking about this because family is uh, um, maybe as a cliche cornerstone of uh, Italianness and Italian Canadianness. And uh, uh, your literary production is uh, very strongly anchored in Italian Canadianness. Uh, please tell us a little bit about that. Yes. Well, uh, you know, when I when I started out as a writer, the last thing I wanted to write about was being Italian Canadian. This was yeah. back in the in the seventies. Uh, you know, the word multiculturalism was was in the air, but it was it was more lip service than than a real mm -hmm. commitment to, uh, to 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 a deep understanding of what it means to be a multicultural society. You know, at the time, it just meant well, let's throw some money for folk dances or ethnic festivals, but there was no real deep appreciation of the contribution of immigrant groups uh, to, to the Canadian mosaic. Uh, and, and in literature, it was clear that if you were writing out of an ethnic background, you ended up ghettoized and, and marginalized. Uh, all of the big writers were, were out of, in, you know, in English Canada, out of the Anglo mainstream and mm -hmm. French Canada, out of the French mainstream. Uh, there were people writing out of their ethnicity. There were a lot of Italian Canadian writers, in fact, but it was very hard for them to uh, to get recognition and, and to be uh, uh, recognized by the larger literary community. And, you know, as a young writer, you don't think, oh, I want to be an Italian Canadian writer. You think, I want to be a writer. That's right. <laughs> I want to be Shakespeare. I want to be Dostoevsky. I don't want to be in that little corner over there where it says, yeah. Uh -huh. You go off and do your little thing, but the big boys are playing over here. Uh, so, so there was a kind of resistance to, to falling into that, you know, that trap. Uh, at the same time, when I came to actually undertake a major project, I realized, you know, that's it. That's what I'm stuck with. You know, this is my life. <laughs> I don't get another life. I don't get another set of experiences. This is what I know. This is what I uh, have some level of authority. Uh, over and I've got to find the way to, to use it. Uh, it was really out of that, uh, uh, you know, out of that confrontation that I wrote my first novel. Uh, and it was, in a way, it was a kind of backhanded way of dealing with the issue. Uh, uh, because I, uh, you know, the, the initial idea I had for the story wasn't about immigration or Italian Canadians at all. It was about a relationship between a brother and sister. But I thought, you know, they have to have a history. Uh, and that's how I ended up in, in Italy. Okay, so that's where they, they start. And I think also the back of my mind, it was a way of getting around the whole, um, uh, the whole question of ethnicity, the way in which we immediately marginalize and, and stereo, uh, place into stereotypes uh, people of you know, so-called ethnic background. When you're at home in your own country, you don't think in those terms. You don't think, oh, I'm Italian, you think, I'm at home. <laughs> this That's is right. my culture. Uh, and in fact, most Italians didn't even think of themselves as Italian until they emigrated. Because, you know, in Italy, you belong to your village. You belong to your region, uh, but mostly to your, to your village. You know, the people five miles away, that's another country. <laughs> They're that's different. Right. Uh, uh, so it was a way, really, of, of working around the whole uh, what happens to people when they immigrate? They, they end up being given an identity that, that, that is, is sort, of, sort of applied from the outside and then ends up deforming in some way how they think about themselves. So for me, it was a way of rethinking that question and looking from the inside, what really happens? What do you start with and what happens to that later on when it gets mm -hmm. transposed in this environment where suddenly you're this marginal thing within this foreign, larger environment? Okay, that's, uh, that's very true, and it's quite relatable to us on a very immediate level as Italian-Canadian. Uh, however, it seems to me, and your Governor General Awards attest to that, that these are relatable stories. They're mm -hmm. stories of immigration, they're stories of the making of Canada, they're mm -hmm. stories of humanity at mm -hmm. large. Mm -hmm. So once we go beyond the names, those, these are shared experiences that go right across. They, they, cut, right, they cut right through. Yes. So have you had that kind of feedback? Because 
the story that you're telling. And I mean, we can start from Vittorio in Lives of the Saints and go all the way to David Pace, which is a completely different novel in sleep. And it's a really hard hitting novel. That It's a story that gets you in the guts. And if I told you that I'm, I'm still processing all of that, having read it months ago, although I'm late in having read it. But those are two extremes of Italian Canadianness that, however, transcend. Where mm -hmm. uh, yes, the, the the root is Italian, but then there's a transformation that happens in between, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, <laughs> uh, and I, you know, I think this is really what literature is about. Literature right. is about going to that depth, so that you you know you go beyond the stereotype, you go beyond the the, the surface categories by which we tend to reduce people really and, and simplify them and, and and Italians as immigrants have been particularly susceptible to that like when you go through historically the kinds of images people have had of Italians they often tend to be very flat uh, and and they tend to go to extremes or either sort of you know the happy peasant type or the dark sort of bandit type uh, and those those stereotypes you see spread over you know a hundred years of immigration in both uh, uh, in, in countries around around the world. Whereas the reality is, you know, Italians, like everyone, are complex human beings. Uh, okay. and, uh, and that's what I see my job as a writer to be, to explore that complexity. So, uh, and, and, you know, the deeper you go into that complexity, the more those common threads become apparent, the more it becomes clear we are all, you know, in this together, that we, uh, and I got a lot of responses, particularly to to lives of the saints, from people who say it come from Poland, uh, from Hungary, from Greece, from China, who said, "Yeah, my village was just like that." Uh, you know, all those things were going on there. Uh, so, so it's clear that uh, you know humanity does have a kind of shared experience, and often it has much more to do with uh, uh, with the particulars of uh, uh, of of, of of, uh, of class, uh, of socioeconomic status than it does with, with ethnicity. Uh, the other thing that you know, I learned and kept, came to understand uh, through, through that first project is that uh, as immigrants, we share a lot in common with every other immigrant, which means every other Canadian, essentially. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, apart from the, the First Nations, most of us are newcomers mm -hmm. uh, to, to this land. And there are all kinds of commonalities just in the experience of immigration, you know, you can see it in reading Susanna Moody's Roughing Into the Bush. You see a person coming from a particular culture experiencing culture shock in trying to adapt to this new land that's very different. Uh, and that's going on over and over again uh, in, in, in the history of this country. And that's, again, I think, I think something that the literature of our country has been showing us uh, that, that these threads connect us also across immigrant groups. Mm -hmm. But it transcends also the experience of migration because what you're developing there is very complex personalities and characters. So I'll give you an example. When I uh, read Lives of the Saints, uh, talking about Vittorio's mother, it made me think uh, of Carmen from uh, the opera Bizet, mm -hmm. uh, an undaunted woman who absolutely refused uh, to the very end, to the bitter end, to conform. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, coming, being in a small town, that was more so um, difficult. So that speaks a little bit also about so the, 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 the femininity and the masculinity yes. in your stories. Tell us a little bit about that, because masculinity is also very, um, it, it's almost a character. I, I find in your in your yeah, novel yes. and the relationships yeah. with fathers and all that. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean you make a, a very good point that you know immigration is like just part of the story. It's it's an interesting part in that the immigrant experience is one that so many of us have been through in one way or another. But there's there's so much else uh, that that I want to deal with when 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 I, when I write a novel. Certainly, when I was writing uh, Lives of the Saints, I was very conscious of uh, of Christina as a woman in a particular type of society. And uh, as Christina, in a way, as some, as a representative of a force of change, of, of modernity, let's say, fighting against 
uh, essentially a kind of almost medieval uh, uh, mindset that still persists persists in in her town. So the book was as much about that moment that that you know the shift that 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 was happening, that has been happening, that we are still living through in so many ways because we are, mm -hmm. we are very slow <laughs> to change. <laughs> um, um, uh, and, 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 and what that meant in terms of, uh, of gender and what that meant in terms of someone like her who, who, you know, who was looking for a different way but had very few uh, paths, very few channels in which to to uh to place that uh that energy and uh uh yeah and certainly you know masculinity uh, that it, it it i guess that comes up has come up in all of my novels uh, mm -hmm. in some ways because uh, you know we, we we are at a crisis moment <laughs> mm -hmm. for for men uh who who have had an, an easy run for you know a few millennia uh uh in terms of uh, you know, feeling like they uh, 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 they had the right <laughs> to mm -hmm. to run things um, and uh, and defining themselves in very particular ways as a result and and finding now that that doesn't work. Uh, you know, in in uh, in lives of the saints, it's it's in a different it's in a it's in a almost kind of pre modern. Uh, uh, world that confrontation of of standard ideas of masculinity. By by the time we get to to sleep, I mean David Pace or David Pace, but uh -huh. calls himself Pace, uh, is in an, is in a new world, one in which uh, you know the, the 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 masculine privileges are under siege, uh, and he's a he's a holdback. You know he's he's trying to hold on to them. And trying to define himself uh, within that context and not doing a very good job of it. And I think, uh, you know, I think this is a big issue for our time. Uh, mm -hmm. And one of the things that concerns me as a writer is how few men read fiction. Uh, uh, and, you know, one of the things that I was trying to address in sleep was, can I, you know, is there a way to talk to guys <laughs> about what they're going through uh, mm -hmm. that might make you know, might give them a language to think about it uh, as well. Because I think fiction is a powerful means of, of you know, dealing with these kinds of deep social problems, essentially, uh, mm -hmm. and social shifts. Uh, but, uh, but men are not using that, that avenue. I'm not sure, I'm not sure how, how far I got through, but I did, you know, I got re very strong reactions from men who, who read sleep. And I think they, you know, I think they recognized mm -hmm. Uh, some of those issues from their own lives and 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 the difficulties of, of dealing with them and I think this is something as a society that we really have to find a way uh, to get our minds around because we you know we see it in a lot of the random acts of violence uh, that we see in young men and that we see um, uh, ongoingly I think are uh, you know I don't want to I don't want to attribute it uh, 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 in any kind of specific way, but I think it's a it is a symptom of a larger shift in how we define ourselves, uh, and I think it's something we have to deal with. You know, it's funny you should say that because I'm not I don't know if you know, but the panel that preceded you was titled "Queer and Italian Canadian." So talk I, about a redefinition of masculinity and gender and gender roles and. Uh, and uh, I don't know, maybe going towards an embracing of all sides of genders that we have inside each of us, so to speak. So you're on that continuum of exploration, it seems to me. Now, you yeah, have- Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, I think this is, again, something that the arts have always tried to do. I mean, you go mm -hmm. all the way back to Shakespeare, like every one of his plays, particularly his comedies, have that kind of interplay of, of gender, uh, but, uh, but it isn't something that, you know, as a larger society, we've yet come to terms with. Uh -huh, no kidding. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to take uh, this opportunity to encourage our audience. I know that there's quite a few people, actually, that have joined us this afternoon. I'm glad to see that this online hasn't discouraged participation and uh, maybe we can make you feel all warm and fuzzy with our literary uh, explorations and of course with uh, Nino. Uh, maybe now is a good time, Nino. I had to ask you to select uh, uh, one or two passages and I'm happy to bookend it with the first, your first and most recent novel. So do you have something that you want to 
uh, proposed to us? Uh, yes. I mean, it's been a while since I've read either of the two books. So. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Lives of the Saints in particular, um, but uh, I, you know, I, I mean, there's one section that I that I've often read uh, that that sort of, I guess, deals with the uh, the immigration issue and and the ways how you know part of part of what lay behind the book for me was also understanding how the immigrant experience was a kind of mythic experience where it was or framed in mythic terms within the immigrant imagination. And I think this was true, and I found this from inter interviewing uh, a lot of Italian immigrants, that they really thought of this as a kind of journey to paradise, to the, the place where the streets were paved with gold. And of course, it, it didn't work out that way. Um, but part of what I was exploring in Lives of the Saints was the kinds of stories we tell ourselves, how we structure our own imaginations as a way of making sense of our lives. So. Uh, the, uh, I'm just going to read a very short section. This is the point at which the narrator, uh, Vittorio, who's six at the time of the action, has just found out uh, from his mother that, uh, that they're going to be going to, to America, uh, actually Canada, uh, to join Vittorio's father, who Vittorio hasn't seen for uh, three or four years at this point. America. How many dreams and fears and contradictions were tied up in that single word? A word which conjured up a world like a name uttered at the dawn of creation, even while it broke another, the one of village and home and family. In Valle del Sole, the men had long been migrants, to the north, to Buenos Aires, to New York, every year weighing their options, whether the drought would ruin the year's crops or a patch of land bring a sufficient price to buy a passage, whether to strike out for Torino or Switzerland with the promise at least of a yearly return, or to reckon on an absence of years or lifetime and cross the sea. Tales of America had been filtering into Valle del Sole for many years already. My grandfather's own father, who in the 1890s, just after my grandfather's birth, had left his family to fight in Abyssinia, had been among the first to reach there. When the war was over, he had begun to wander, first along the coast of Africa, and my grandfather used to joke that he had taken an African bride and that somewhere now I had a brood of creamy brown cousins who prayed in African but swore in Italian. Then on to Argentina and finally New York. For several years he had sent money back in increasingly large sums, enough to build the house we now lived in, but suddenly the money stopped and nothing more was heard of him. After a year my grandfather's oldest brother had gone in search of him but had returned in despair. Vanished, my grandfather had told me. He might have died or he might still be there now, a hundred years old, living like a king with some American wife. Uh, wow. Uh, uh, yeah, so that, uh, you know, that, uh, that section, it, I think, gives a, a fairly accurate idea, really, of how people talked about uh, uh, you know America uh, from the, from from the perspective of the old country, uh, and though and even though they often had access to accurate information, they had people who'd gone over and were writing back and telling them what things were like. There was always that there was always that kind of mythical side to it of 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 a promised land they were they were hoping to reach. And again, one of the things that I found uh, in 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 my research and in interviewing immigrants was that often that that um, dynamic end up getting reversed uh, through immigration that that once they'd established themselves say in Canada and had been re relatively prosperous they then began to romanticize the land they'd left behind that it was sort of the lost paradise the lost place of wholeness yes we were poor but we had enough to eat uh, we were well uh, uh, and and I and I you know I I found it very poignant that that very strong sense I got in speaking to immigrants of, of that, that lost wholeness that can never be recaptured. And even when they traveled back there, they couldn't recapture it because they'd become Canadianized. Their Italian now was mixed with English words that they weren't even aware of. People saw them as, you know, as old fashioned sometimes because they were still speaking the old dialect or they saw them as no longer uh, real residents. Um, and uh, uh, and there's a kind of very 
you know, poignant element uh, to, to the immigrant experience, experience in that regard, and that you, they never, you never really wholly integrate into the new country, but you can never really go back uh, to the old one. And that was certainly a part of what I was, I was exploring in, uh, in that first trilogy. Uh, mm -hmm. By the time I get to to sleep, uh, right. uh, uh, when I you know when I think about identity uh, now, I I you know I think about it as this very complex thing that is you know it's a um, it's something we put together haphazardly with whatever materials are given to us over time. So you know I was I was raised in a small southern Ontario town where. You know, the Catholicism I had there was not the Catholicism of Italy. It was post-Vatican II, and it was much more um, uh, uh, streamlined and demystified. Uh, the Latin was gone. You didn't talk about the saints. There was an right. emphasis on the miracles. Uh, uh, I lived close to the border. The TV I watched was American. The music I listened to was American. I had all these American influences, uh, which informed me. Um, uh, you know, I had this, this panoply of different uh, cultural influences that made me what I am. So my, my Italianness, you know, took shape within uh, the framework of all these other things. And I think we need to think of identity uh, in those terms, not as singular, not as defining, uh, not even as determined, but something that uh, uh, is available. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. We have sources available to us. I, you know, I made a conscious decision at a certain point to travel to Italy and reown uh, elements right. of my culture that that my parents never had access to. You know, I spent a year studying in Florence. What did my parents know of Florentine culture growing up in, in the villages that they grew up in? Uh, but I had access to it through them. Um, so, uh, so that's how I think about identity now as something that is. Uh, multifaceted and something that to a certain extent we can choose and enhance. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, you know, in, in, in some ways my David Pace character uh, was an offshoot of that idea. He has this attachment, he's a, he's a historian, his area is, is Roman history, so he has that visceral attachment to his past. At the same time, he has a very troubled relationship with his father, uh, and a very troubled relationship with his father's history. Uh, and, and it's constantly trying to find the way uh, to, uh, um, uh, to pick and choose in a way that makes uh, sense. Uh, uh, there's, I mean, there are a lot of things going on in this book. Uh, one of the things, uh, one of the uh, plot premises is that uh, uh, Pace comes down with a sleep disorder, uh, sort of uh, early in the story, uh, and the sleep disorder is really a kind of metaphor for um, uh, for his own life. The fact that in some ways he has been sleepwalking through his life and lying to himself about a lot of things. Uh, in some ways, the sleep disorder becomes a kind of wake-up call where he has to confront uh, a lot of those lies. I'm just going to read from the beginning of the book because uh, that uh, requires the least setup. Uh, the chapter is entitled Methylphenidate. A wash of chemicals floods David's brain, and at once the urge is there, irresistible. What is the trigger? What switch opens the floodgate? If he could find it, he could control it. But even to think of the urge is to bring it on. Dad, Dad. These are the times it overtakes him, when he is reading, when he is watching, when he is listening. At the crossroads of action and thought, the mind's gathering place, the very place where he lives, when he is driving. Daddy, wake up. He hears a thundering like a stampede. He sees chariots, horses. Then the image splinters and there is only the noise itself, jagged and black, until finally the expressway pixelates into clarity and he realizes he has veered onto the rumble strip. A car is stopped on the shoulder not a hundred meters in front of them. They are headed straight forward. Dad, there's a car. Afterwards, David will never quite be able to sort out his memory of what happens next in any way that makes sense. 
It will seem as if he is split in two. On one side of him, the nuclear blast of sensation, the thump of his wheels, the stopped car, his son's grating terror. On the other, an eerie calmness, as if every fiber in him has long been preparing for just such a moment when everything hangs in the balance. He will be amazed how much data has been left in him by an event that has happened in the blink of an eye. The slant of autumn light through the windshield, the color of the car, silver gray, he is heading toward. The look of its driver, a small, dark-skinned man, Middle Eastern or Asian, who has stopped to make a call or stretch his legs or take a leak as he innocently turns to check for traffic before opening his door, only to discover that death is bearing down on him. And already before it comes, David sees the crash, the mess of twisted metal and broken glass and ruined flesh. I'll stop there. Yes, and it gets much more uh, hard hitting as it goes on, which I found uh, very satisfying actually in the story because humanity is complex. It didn't daunt me, it didn't deter me, and by the same complexity and the same darkness you find in the trilogy as well. So it seems to me that there's a lot of dealing with loss. Yes. The characters deal a lot with loss. Uh, yes. Uh, I mean, we all deal a lot with loss. Life is about loss. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure, you know, I can't say that in my life I have suffered a lot of loss. I've actually been <laughs> quite lucky that way, but, uh, you know, it didn't strike me. It strike it struck me as a young age that, 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 that possibility exists uh, of losing. And in fact, is the normal way of things that you will lose everything. Uh, bit by bit, things will break down. Your favorite toy will break. Uh, you will uh, lose, uh, uh, you know, uh, a favorite uh, pen. Uh, you, you know, from the the tiniest, most trivial to the biggest, and the people in your life will 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 disappear, and you will disappear. Uh, I mean, this is really what it means uh, to be human, and and so it is often. It's often the underlying story. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, in, in a lot of literature. And it, as I say, I, it wasn't something that was particularly notable in my life. And yet it was something that I was aware of from a young age, maybe in small ways. I think, uh, you know, part of it was growing up a child of immigrants. Uh, you know, the, uh, my parents both came from peasants background, peasant backgrounds. I think there was something in the peasant mentality, a kind of uh, fatalism almost, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the belief that there's something out there that will get you. <laughs> okay. uh, and, and don't stick your head up because if you do, it will, you know, it will be ready. Uh, so never brag, uh, you know, if you have a good year on the farm, don't say so, you know, complain. <laughs> uh, uh, and, and always believe that the wolf is at the door. Uh, and that's sort of how I grew up. Uh, uh, you know, I, I tell the story of asking my, my mom once when I was six, if she would buy me a chocolate bar when she's going to the grocery store. And she turns to me, she says, Nino, don't you know we owe the bank $60,000? <laughs> That's a heavy burden to carry at six. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> okay, no chocolate okay, for you. Forget the, forget the chocolate bar. <laughs> Uh, well, I that, guess that you know, was your singular experience with loss from which you have drawn so much that you have been able to present it so poignantly in your writing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it, 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 was a, it was just a feeling in the air. And uh, mm -hmm. even things like, you know, people die, you go to funerals and the, 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 you know, the atmosphere around death, almost as if you've been, you've been humiliated in some way. You've done something wrong for this death to have come into your community. It was always that sense of something waiting uh, to strike. I think as people became more settled and more successful, that that began to lift. But, you know, I certainly remember it very well from, uh, from my childhood, and maybe that's where that comes from. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to, uh, I would have more questions myself, but I'm going to refrain and I'm going to actually pass it to our audience because I see that we have a question and Betty is asking, which is your favorite piece? Which one reflects Nino Ricci? Which, which of my novels? I, I think so, yes. Yeah. yeah, I always hate this question. You know? <laughs> 
I think of my novels sitting there on the desk <laughs> listening. Say, what's he going to say? What's he going to say? Which one's he going to pick? And uh, you know, it's like your your children. Would you say in front of your children, "Well, yes, uh, Alfredo, you're my favorite." <laughs> uh, no, you don't want to say that. But uh, you know, the other side is that you don't want to. Like, I don't, I don't want to negate uh, uh, myself in a way, uh, or or even say that I know my work well enough. Uh, to, to make that kind of a judgment. There are books that are, you know, the, my first book is dear to me for many reasons, because it was my first book, because it did well, because it, it told the kind of story in the way that I wanted to tell it. It worked out uh, in a way that I never expected it to. Uh, my second book, which was probably my least um, well-received book, in part because it, it came after my first book, uh, mm -hmm. and but changed in tone, and yet, it also has, a, you know, I think about that book quite a bit. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I don't, I've, I haven't reread it either, but, and there are certain people who have read that book who, who, who were quite affected by it. So it, it has a special place in my heart exactly because it, it feels like the, the kind of wounded uh, sibling yeah, yeah. that never got its due. Um, uh, uh, the Origin of Species is, uh, is, is special to me because it, it's probably my most autobiographical book. Uh, and it dealt, you know, the, 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 the main, one of the main characters in the book, uh, a woman named Esther, was based fairly closely on a friend of mine who, who died of multiple sclerosis. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, uh, and the book was kind of a tribute to her and to her amazing character. So that book is very special for me. Um, uh, you know, sleep, I, I don't know where that book came from. It, it was very difficult to write. I don't know who that guy is, <laughs> David. Mm -hmm. He's not me, but somehow he was there, and it, you know, it took me quite a while to get to know him and to try and get him right. Uh, but there's something, you know, there was something very compelling about that story for me. I, I guess, you know, my feeling is that my favorite book is always the one that I'm working on right now. <laughs> that's, that's right. So tell us um, um, in one minute, if you could tell us a little bit about what you're working on right now. I understand you're already on a second draft. And I'm saying one minute because then I would like to bring up with us to join us another couple of people. Uh, because we're going to have, as, as you know, uh, actually a special connection with uh, 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 a uh, uh, literary festival, Italian literary festival in London, UK. So uh, I pass it to you. Yes. And uh, meantime, I'm going to bring up our next uh, friend. Yeah, well, that's very appropriate because my the novel I'm working on is set in London, huh? uh, in the uh, in the 15 months uh, leading up to the First World War, uh, uh, and it's um, it's kind of a sprawling novel that's about the birth of modernism. It's about uh, how we blindly uh, fall into disasters like the First World War without knowing how we did mm -hmm. it, uh, the kinds of factors that can make that happen. Uh, it's about uh, uh, the fact that a lot of what we are dealing with now, uh, culturally and socially and technologically, really started in the first decade of, uh, of the 20th century. Uh, telecommunications, mass transit, uh, feminism, uh, uh, so many social movements, um, uh, so many of the ways in which we think of ourselves as, as humans on this planet, consumerism, uh, decline of religion, like all that really was already in full uh, uh, nascence uh, by the first decade of, uh, of the 20th century. So it's a way really of trying to understand the present day by understanding that, that period a bit more deeply. Wow, and doing it in London. So yes, you're right. This thing uh, uh, helps us really with uh, introducing our our next friend who is joining us. I have uh, we have with us Marco Mancasola, and Marco, there you go. I see you there. Uh, and we also have with us. Uh, so Marco Mancasola. First of all, let's make some introductions before uh, I get lost in uh, in my papers. Marco Mancasola is an Italian author based in London, UK. Uh, whose work is published by the main Italian publishing houses and by Gallimard in France. He is the founder and creative writings, uh, of the creative writing school Londra 
scrive. In 2017, with the help of other London-based Italian authors and with the Italian Cultural Institute in London, UK, he founded Phil, Festival of Italian Literature in London. Marco, benvenuto fra noi. Prima di darti un attimo la parola, voglio presentare anche, voglio, uh, sì, presentare anche Daniela Sansone, che uh, 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 fa parte del piccolo gruppo che uh, ha organizzato, che organizza uh, Librissimi e abbiamo anche uh, Michela, dovrebbe esserci anche Michela Di Marco, eccolo là, Michela Di Marco, uh, Presidente del Comites e quindi uh, e il Comites uh, è l'organizzatore di Librissimi. Uh, quindi voglio salutare Marco, passarti un attimo la parola, fare la, pres la presentazione Marco Nino e, e passarla a te Marco, visto che abbiamo un, un nuovo romanzo che si ambienterà a Londra e come vanno le cose a Londra. Beh, allora, saluti a tutti, grazie. Allora, è bello portare un, un messaggio dalla comunità italiana di Londra, letteraria italiana di Londra, a voi e al vostro festival che si sta svolgendo oggi. E ho seguito con, con, con piacere allora, l'intervento di, di Lino Ricci, e ho scoperto con piacere di questa prossima ambientazione romanzesca a Londra. Eh, non lo so, io ho tempo di fare anch'io una domanda a Nino? Prego, sì. con allora, piacere. Eh, no, allora, eh, eh, mi, mi ha colpito molto, il, allora, i due brani che anche ha letto mi hanno colpito molto, e, però visto che gli è stato chiesto eh, quella domanda che agli autori non piace di solito sentirsi fare, ovvero qual è il libro che hai scritto e che è il tuo preferito, no? perché è come, scrivere, come chiedere a un genitore qual è il tuo bambino preferito. Eh, però al tempo stesso Nino ha un po' risposto dicendo che comunque il libro più, uh, più, più, più recente, l'ultimo che si è scritto, inevitabilmente è quello con cui ci si sente comunque più attaccati ancora. E, e visto che il suo romanzo d'esordio è uscito, non lo so, nel 1990 qualcosa, mi sembra, ed è un romanzo che è nato molto bene e che dunque chiaramente eh, proietta un'ombra, un un un'ombra no? un lunga, bella, un'ombra positiva, però non anche sul resto della carriera di un autore, quando un libro d'esordio va molto bene. Ecco, eh, volevo chiedere a Nino Ricci come si sente quando rilegge il suo romanzo d'esordio, se è una voce che riconosce ancora, se è una voce che invece gli, gli fa chiedere chi era costui, no, da dove usciva questa voce, come facevo a sapere queste cose, come mi è venuta in mente questa storia, eccetera. Oppure se sente ancora una vicinanza intima con quel narratore. Mm -hmm. Uh, una buona domanda. Uh, non so se posso rispondere in italiano. Uh, Tutte e due. Uh, in un modo abbastanza complesso. Uh, cioè non è una cosa facile. Ci sono uh, delle cose che riconosco. Uh, cioè sì, riconosco quella voce. Riconosco anche quello che stavo pensando al momento in cui uh, avevo scritto quello. Uh, spesso penso, ma come mai, come l'ho fatto a quel punto a pensare in questa, questo modo che ora non posso? Cioè, uh, spesso mi sembra accada che da giovane avevo una mente più agile, più adetto a, a sperimentare, a trovare delle parole uh, un po' fuori comune, invece ora spendo... Uh, ore e ore con il thesaurus cercando, <ride> invece prima mi sembra che mi viene più, più facilmente, ma forse è un mito, forse, forse non, non ricordo bene. Uh, ma nello stesso tempo c'è un modo in cui è un libro scritto da, da straniero, cioè sarebbe impossibile per me, per esempio, scrivere il mio primo romanzo a questo punto. Mi ricordo che quando sono stato in Italia per la, la riuscita dell'edizione italiano e mi trovò eh, eh, nel confronto dei miei paesani, diciamo, molisani, e ho pensato, ma che cosa pensavo io di scrivere questo romanzo ambientato nel suo mondo? Io non so niente <ride> di questo mondo eh, eh, paragonato con loro. Cioè, a questo punto non avrò uh, il coraggio di scriverlo. E questa è una cosa di, di essere giovane, che, che hai questa uh, innocenza, <ride> insomma, di, di non sapere che non è permesso. <ride> 
però, <ride> insomma, parlando di cosa è permesso e cosa non è permesso, eh, noto che c'è un'altra domanda, ci cioè, sono due a dire il vero, una è abbastanza lunga. Eh, eh, c'è anche la domanda di Rosanna eh, che dice, Rosanna Battigelli, you probably know her Nino because she's saying hi to you. Yes. And uh, she said if there's another genre that you're interested in exploring, if I could ask you to give me a quick answer to that. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a quick answer. Biography it's was up there, though. It's too late. I, I you know, I, initially I wanted to write for film, and that I would have been very unhappy. Uh, my my few experiences with film have shown me that it's not it's not a realm for creators. <laughs> oh. Because uh, the the writer in 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 film is is at the very bottom of the totem pole. So I'm very happy as a novelist. Okay, excellent. Um, we do have. A rather long question from Bernardina Di Pietro. I'm afraid I don't think that we can um, get to that, unfortunately, in this section. Also because we uh, wanted to give a little bit of space to Marco Mancasola to tell us a little bit about the situation in London with Phil uh, and also to, because what's, what's really the, 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 the fil rouge uh, of this festival and, and all other literary festivals is that we're in times of COVID and so there's a, a lot of uh, cancellations, postponements and, and a lot of rethinking going on. So Marco, tell us a little bit about how things are going, are, are being lived in London and how Phil is affected and there you go. Uh, Phil è un festival di, di comunità come il vostro, nel senso che riflette una, una comunità, dal punto di vista di una comunità rispetto alla realtà in cui vive. E... Essendo la comunità italiana a Londra, chiaramente è un festival inevitabilmente eh, molto, con voci molto, molto multiculturali. Eh, è tutto basato sull'idea di scambio, di incontro, autori italiani che, o che vivono in Inghilterra o in UK, oppure che vengono dall'Italia o da altrove, e che incontrano autori di altre, di altre provenienze, autori british o di europei, eccetera. Ecco, ehm, questa dimensione di comunità poi è anche una forte dimensione fisica e di atmosfera, perché fino alla prima edizione si tiene in un bellissimo teatro vittoriano che si chiama Coronet a Notting Hill, che è comparso anche in, in alcuni film. Ehm, ecco, dunque è un festival che deve molto a questa dimensione di comunità, di incontro, eh, ma anche al luogo in cui si svolge. Per cui eh, credo che ogni festival abbia una sua una sua individualità, una sua personalità e, e per alcuni forse sarà un po' più facile ehm, in questo periodo di mezzo, speriamo sia un periodo di mezzo, eh, andare online, per altri è un po' più difficile immagino. E per cui Phil 2020 accadrebbe a novembre e ci stiamo ancora prendendo un po' di settimane per capire cosa accadrà, cosa non accadrà. Um, credo che L'incognita più grande, tutto sommato, sia cosa accadrà a Londra, perché uh, credo che tutte le grandi città occidentali, così come le conosciamo, insomma, usciranno cambiate, no? e nella, in particolare ne usciranno cambiate le grandi città, le grandi metropoli europee che vivono di immigrazione europea, certo. e, e Londra in particolare. Londra, per almeno una quindicina d'anni, è stata la meta preferita di una generazione di giovani italiani che arrivavano a volte anche semplicemente per vedere che aria tirava, per provare, per fare no, lavori più o meno temporanei, sperando di fare poi altro, eccetera. Comunque un'immigrazione più di expa che non no, l'immigrazione uh, di generazioni, no, che invece magari conoscete di più in Nord America. Questo ne fa una realtà... Um, più, forse più dinamica ma anche più volatile e dunque credo che nei prossimi mesi uh, vedremo un grande riflusso di italiani londinesi che torneranno in Italia soprattutto quelli che purtroppo hanno perso il lavoro nella ristorazione ad esempio o in altri settori ecco questo cambierà un po' l'umore cambierà, cambierà un po' il clima inevitabilmente di Londra e della comunità, delle comunità straniere che vivono a Londra della comunità italiana non significa necessariamente no, che tutto finisce, okay, ma dico che ci sarà una trasformazione in atto e probabilmente ci si troverà anche a sentirsi un po', un po diversi. Forse gli italiani, la comunità italiana a Londra sarà una comunità più, più stanziale a quel punto, più piccola forse. No? Eh, ecco, 
Sarà da vedere e credo che col, con Phil, con il festival, troveremo a riflettere anche questo. Phil è sempre stato un festival che uh, ha sposato da sempre letteratura e attualità, letteratura e politica, letteratura e Brexit ovviamente, uh, dibattiti sull'Europa, sulla politica, sull'Italia, su Londra, sul femminismo, uh, sulla classe sociale, su tutta una serie di cose su cui ci interessava sentire cosa i romanzieri che invitavamo avevano da dire, italiani o non italiani. E, per cui a maggior ragione ora ci piacerebbe sapere cosa le persone che inviteremmo uh, direbbero su come si trasformerà Londra, le, come cambieranno le cose, uh, come si trasformerà il romanzo, come il romanzo proverà a raccontare questo momento storico, eccetera. Insomma, ci sarebbero tante cose di cui parlare e la vocazione di Phil sarebbe proprio fare quelle domande e provare a mettere insieme delle voci per parlarne. Se questo accadrà a novembre sarà un po' da vedere, ecco. Uh, per cui spero che ora che abbiamo questo contatto anche tra di noi no? e certo. eh, resteremo aggiornati anche su questo certo, certo, infatti stiamo cercando veramente di costruire ponti come abbiamo già detto perché abbiamo ospitato prima per esempio nel nostro primo panel abbiamo ospitato Idea, il festival Idea di Boston tu conosci bene Nicola Oricuglia, uno degli organizzatori subito dopo avremo anche uh, Uh, Antonella Ferrara, la presidente di Tau Book, il festival del libro internazionale di Tarmina. Quindi ehm, in qualche modo, non soltanto la tecnologia, ma chissà, in qualche modo anche il Covid sta uh, riducendo un po' la dimensione del mondo. Uh, sento un rumore, spero che non venga da me. No, penso che andiamo bene. Uh, allora, ci rimangono giusto tre minuti. Io quello che voglio fare, leggo due commenti che ci sono stati mandati per Nino, poi passo velocemente la parola a Michela e Daniela perché ci tengo che anche loro possano salutare sia Nino che Marco e dopodiché sarà il momento di passare al nostro prossimo panel, un po' mozzafiato, però sta andando bene. Allora Nino, Berden Bernardina Di Pietro is saying that she teaches Uh, your book in her uh, class Italian Canadian Studies at uh, University College at U of T. Uh, she had a question about the lives of the saints where she said that you really captured the uh, small town Italian literature so well in the book and especially the moments where you focus on Italian women and describe, uh, describe the Italian women as they're washing clothes and having conversations about working like dogs. Uh, she's wondering if as a young boy you listened to Italian women's conversations and recreated some of those moments in the novel. And she's mentioning that one of the students uh, uh, has discussed uh, with whom uh, she has discussed it Uh, and I discuss is Linda Hutchison's classification of fictionalized uh, autobiography, uh, or maybe to expand on the idea, um, uh, the idea to fictionalize biography, and if in some ways there are fictionalized biographies in the novel. Uh, I'm afraid I haven't conveyed very well uh, the question, and unfortunately we really don't have time to get into it. We also have uh, uh, somebody connected from Molise who says hi, Serenella uh, Sessito, full disclosure, it's my sister, she knew where you were here, they live in Isernia, so they know what's going on. They, uh -huh. There's a connection and they met you many years ago, so they're saying hi. Uh, and uh, passo la parola a, a Michele e Daniela per fare, per fare quest'ultimo saluto prima di dover cambiare. Nino, io ti ringrazio di tutto cuore per essere stata, stato con noi e spero che si possa rifare in qualche modo nel futuro. Basta. Ah, lo aspettiamo, lo aspettiamo alla versione dal vivo di Librissimi, ad entrambi. Annino, uh, come insomma, espressione di grande autore uh, qui nella nostra comunità e non solo, e a Marco, creiamolo questo ponte, quindi vi aspettiamo ad entrambi. Un abbraccio e grazie per la vostra ciao. disponibilità. E vi ringrazio anch'io, Nino, ciao! Ciao, ciao! Ci siamo conosciuti tanti anni fa. E ciao anche a Marco, siete stati estremamente interessanti, è stato molto insomma, bello sentire l'esperienza di, di Nino assolutamente e anche capire un po' questo spirito che c'è a Londra, insomma questa sorta di... siamo tutti un po' in sospeso per vedere che cosa succederà dopo questo periodo del Covid, quindi sì, assolutamente aggiorniamoci. Perfetto, grazie a tutti, arrivederci. Grazie, grazie. 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 grazie a voi, ciao. ciao.